currently I'm working on, on uh, looking at some of my prior work with how people respond to prior outcomes, per particularly financial losses, and applying that, uh, the insights that I got out of the lab from looking at how uh, market participants such as re retail investors and market experts particularly institutional investors, whether they behave in similar ways. So uh, one of the things that we're doing, we have a unique data set of institutional investors, and we're seeing if similar sorts of biases that we found in the lab show up in that data as well. And we're finding some really interesting uh, effects there, particularly on the selling side, which they don't seem to be paying attention to as much. The other line of work that I'm doing, uh, joint with Aislinn Bourne and Michael Rosenberg, is looking at the dynamics of discrimination. So a lot of my work has to do with dynamic decision making in general, how prior outcomes affect choices. And what we're looking at there is, can you use dynamic data on discrimination to try to identify its source? So uh, a kind of a struggle in the prior literature on discrimination has been, A, a lot of papers have documented discrimination, but it's notoriously difficult to identify its source. So theoretically, we argue that if you actually collect dynamic data, this will allow you to uh, uh, essentially identify whether it's discrimination is due to preferences or beliefs, and whether those beliefs are correct or incorrect. So we do the theoretical exercise, and then we run a large field experiment where we can actually study the dynamics in a causal fashion. So we can exogenously vary the identity of the individual who's uh, interacting on the platform and their reputation, the stage that they're at. And we actually find that initially there's just discrimination against women on this platform, but at high uh, reputation levels, discrimination not only is mitigated, it actually reverses, which according to our uh, theoretical framework says that the initial discrimination was belief-based, but those beliefs are actually incorrect, that there's some sort of bias going on in this setting. So I'm pretty excited about these, uh, these two lines of work that I'm engaged in. So there's actually two papers, and they're very related. Um, so one is called a fine as a price, and the other call is called pay enough or don't pay at all. Both are by Yuri Gnizzi and Aldo Rustichini, and these are papers that Uri and uh, Aldo wrote in the early 2000s. And when I first read these papers, I was shocked by the elegance of the experiments that they use as well as kind of the sort of data that they collect. They combine field evidence they com with lab evidence. And the most important thing is that they address a question using these experiments that's fundamental to economics, which is how do people respond to incentives? So standard economic theory says that, look, if you pay people more, they should work more, they should pre perform harder, and so on. But what they actually find is that if you don't pay people enough money, if you pay them just a little bit, that could actually lead to a decrease in performance, decrease in effort, and decrease in motivation in this population. And because they use both lab and field evidence, this becomes a very convincing story. And for me, this was very inspirational, that you can use uh, a variety of techniques uh, from the lab to the field, and then uh, answer a question that broadly economists are interested in. And I was lucky enough to actually be working under Yuri Gnizzi uh, when I w uh, entered into uh, graduate school. He was my supervisor. So I'm obviously biased, but uh, I would um, say that one of the mo more important questions in behavioral economics is how do people uh, create mental accounts. What is the theory for mental accounting? So mental accounts are basically uh, these psychological frames that people have for themselves that determine which outcomes and events and prospects are grouped together and which outcomes and prospects are evaluated separately. So you can have a savings account in your head and then you can have an entertainment account. This money could all be in your bank account, but you're s mentally separating it and evaluating it separately. And so for example, if you get a birthday present, you get $100, you deposit it in your bank account, but in your mind, you're putting that into the entertainment account, and then you're more likely to go see movies, you're more likely to see a concert, and things like that. And we, uh, you know, with Richard Thaler's uh, early papers, we have uh, a lot of empirical evidence that people ha do cr have these mental accounts and follow up work with, by Jesse Shapiro, but I think what we're missing is really a, uh, a basic model of how these mental accounts come about, what effects, 
how people book things to one account versus the other, when does a mental account close, and so on and so forth. I think we have, we're starting to get a lot of empirical evidence, but I think on the theoretical side, there's still a lot, work, uh, a lot of work to be done, and I, to me, that seems like a, a worthy endeavor. My name is Alex Simas, and I'm a behavioral economist at Carnegie Mellon University.